Okay, so welcome back to the second half of module four. We're going to be going over clustering in this module or in this part. Um, I realize it's a lot to go over in one day, uh, trying to get through linear modeling, classification, clustering. Uh, we've kind of tried to reduce one or two years worth of statistics courses down into a, a two day chunk. Uh, so it's a, it's a lot to get through. Um, I hope that if it's tough to pay attention right now, I hope that you're at least able to go back and look over the labs later, because I do think that they are really useful, especially for anything that you're unsure of at the moment. If you go back through the completed labs, they should have uh, better documentation. And so hopefully that it's something that you're able to kind of, you know, teach yourself a little bit at a later time and you might be in a better headspace for it after you haven't had, you know, eight hours straight of statistics for a couple days in a row. Um, so with that, we're going to get into the clustering. Um, so the objectives for this module are to introduce what clustering is and when you would apply it, uh, understand what kind of data works well for clustering. We're going to look at a couple common clustering methods like we did for the classification methods. And then a uh, big issue with clustering is how do you know how many clusters to have? Because often there is no you know, correct answer, where in classification, you can split into training and testing, and then you can make predictions on the testing set. And then you can compare your predictions with the observed values. And you can say, oh, okay, it did a good job, or oh, okay, it didn't do a good job. But with clustering, there is no true answer to compare to typically. So the method of determining what is a good number of clusters is kind of a bit more holistic in that you need to consider several things, you need to take an expert opinion, and you need to work with other people to identify what makes sense for your data. So it's a little bit more involved and not quite as quantifiable, which I know some people don't like, but uh, it's a little more difficult in that sense. So going back to the overall decision tree, uh, we're now here, kind of right in the middle. So we're in the clustering section. So there's a few different kinds of clustering. Uh, well, there's actually many kinds of clustering, uh, but there's like flat clustering, hierarchical clustering. These have different methods. Uh, and then basically for all clustering methods, you do need to determine what is an optimal number of clusters. And then from here, you can do things like evaluate their stability, optimize distant metrics, these values and uh, statistical analyses can kind of help you identify an num optimal number of clusters um, or the optimal clustering method. But again, it needs to be more of a holistic approach than uh, other things within statistics. So what exactly is clustering? So it's an area of unsupervised learning where we want to group similar observations. So unsupervised learning is anything where there isn't a true observation to compare to. So in the previous classification example, we did have true values that we try to predict. You compare the true and the uh, predicted, see how well it performs. But for clustering, like I said earlier, there is no true proper number of clusters. So we've just got to try our best and identify what works. So there's no predefined labels. Um, there are two main types of clustering, hard clustering, uh, where each data point is in one group. So, you know, your group A or your group B, or there are soft clustering methods where uh, you might be assigned, okay, there's a 30% chance your group A, 70% chance that your group B. And so these are just kind of used in different scenarios. Um, so what are some common methods? Uh, the ones that we'll be going over are k-means, hierarchical clustering, and k-nearest neighbors. Now, k-nearest neighbors is also a classification method and it's actually mostly used for classification. Uh, but you can also use it for clustering. So I'm kind of trying to have it do double duty, only introduce it once, and hopefully you can use it in both scenarios. Um, so k-means. So it's a centroid-based clustering method that partitions data into, well, k clusters. But what value of k should you use? How many clusters, right? So that's something that we'll be addressing in the walkthrough lab how do you actually go about doing that realistically for a data set? So essentially what it does is it iteratively 
identifies centroids. Um, and basically it tries to calculate how far are the actual observations from each of the cluster centroids. And so based off that, in kind of identify, well, all of these observations are closest to this one. So that belongs, so they belong in that cluster. And so it's just kind of an iterative way to minimize the distance between uh, estimated centroids uh, as the center of clusters and the observations and how far they fall from it. So again, it's this issue of estimating the choice of the number of clusters K. So there's kind of, there's a lot of ways to go about it, um, but the three main ones that we're going to be looking at today are starting with the top is within cluster sum of squares. And this is just a quantifiable metric. And what it tells you is it tries to identify the quality of the clusters. You know, how close are they? If everything's really spread out, then it's probably not a great cluster. But if everything's very tight and condensed, then it's probably a good cluster. Um, working clockwise, there's silhouette analysis. And this measures how similar a data point is to its own cluster compared to how similar it is to other clusters. So it's just, again, another quantifiable method of trying to identify you know, the quality of the clustering. And then the third method is a PCA plot. And so what you can do with PCA is you can plot the observations based off their first two principal components. You can do it in higher dimensions, but it obviously gets more difficult to interpret. So we'll be dealing with the first two principal components for an XY plot. Um, and then based off this, you can kind of visualize based on the two principal components, how the observations cluster together. Now, the issue is this doesn't always directly correlate or match up with the other clusters estimated through uh, within cluster sum of squares and silhouette analysis. These three metrics may actually give different results. So this is where it becomes uh, an issue of trying to identify, are there any consistencies among the three methods? Is there anything that we can kind of try and parse out from the three of them, even though they do give different information? So again, it's this idea of a holistic approach. So the next method that we're going to look at is hierarchical clustering. Hierarchical clustering, uh, what it does is it creates a tree-like structure called a dendogram. And these are really useful because it helps you identify visually how the model is actually clustering things together. So this is just an example of a dendogram that I've made in the past. Um, so from this, you can create dendograms in two ways. You can start at the bottom up where each individual observation is its own cluster, and then it's joined with other observations based on if they're similar enough. And then you work your way up joining clusters together if they're similar enough until you get to everything all together at once. Or you can do a top-down approach where everything is in one cluster. So you start at the top of the dendogram and then you make splits in that cluster based off what's the most different. So if anybody's familiar with like um, variable selection in terms of like forwards versus backwards stepwise selection, it's kind of the same idea. It's just do you start with everything together all at once, or do you start with everything independently and then join them? Um, but the dendograms are really useful, like I said, because um, it's another way to try and manually identify how many clusters you should have. So you can pair this with expert knowledge and say, well, I realize that, you know, maybe on the right side of the dendogram, the far right, the, the three trees there, maybe they aren't that different based off what's being grouped together based on our expert knowledge of the subject area. So we can just consider that entire branch one cluster instead of splitting it up into at most, you know, six clusters or something like that. Um, so it takes a bit of visualization and trying to understand your data to determine the optimal number of clusters from the hierarchical clustering method. And then the third method, K nearest neighbors, as I said, at the start, it's usually used for classification, but it actually also works for clustering. Um, and that's how it was introduced to me. Um, so I always think of it as a clustering algorithm first, even though I think most people that you talk to would probably think of it as a classification algorithm first, but regardless, it can do both. So like I said at the start, I'm kind of hoping to do a bit of double duty here and in introducing it to you in a clustering um, application. And then hopefully you're able to take that and apply it to classification as well. 
Uh, but the way it works is it assigns each point to a cluster based on the average from its k nearest neighbors. So it just identifies uh, how close are you to these other observations and what clusters do they belong to. So it's just going, well, you know, most of your neighbors are in cluster number three. So we're going to assume you're also in cluster number three. And it just iterates through this. Um, but it also has the issue of how do you estimate the number of clusters? So an issue becomes if you have to identify the number of clusters using expert opinion, using you know various different uh, methods, which may not all align or even agree with one another, how confident can you be in the clusters? This is where my application as a statistician isn't really that important. It's more so you really have to understand the data and the application that you're doing, right? This is where the interdisciplinarism of bioinformatics really comes into play. You need the biologist. Yes, as a statistician, I can do all the number crunching for you, but at the end of the day, I don't really understand phylogenetic trees, so I need somebody to explain it to me. And so from this, maybe you may have a better understanding of biologically speaking, what should be clustered together. So it's kind of the same thing with classification is we need to work together to identify an optimal way of going about this analysis. And so the hope is with this course is that, you know, you'll be able to speak my language a bit better. And I'm hoping that through uh, gaining a better understanding of biology, I'll be able to speak your language a little bit better. And then from there, we can work together more efficiently to kind of identify better models and uh, different applications that we can work together on. So it's all about the interdisciplinarism of bioinformatics and trying to understand what different people with different backgrounds bring to the table and how you can work together to make these decisions because you really do need a diverse array of backgrounds and expertise in order to make a holistic, coherent decision for this. So another thing that I said is that the different methods may give a different number of clusters but sometimes you're able to actually parse out similarities among these clusters. And I think that'll just become more obvious as we start getting into the lab a bit more. Um, we might see that in the example. So with that, uh, we're going to start the clustering lab. Uh, did anybody have any questions about the lecture material? <laughs>